to do this talk, I had just taken part in a writing workshop at San May Gallery, which was led by writers Min Ying Huang and Sam Watkins. And the workshop formed part of the external programming of an exhibition by artist Ro Ru Mo, um, which took Ursula K. Le Guin's often cited text, The Carrier Bag <laughs> Theory of Fiction, as a starting point to think about our interactions with objects in space and time. So we sat in a circle um, within the exhibition and began a, f um, a process of free writing to explore the poetics of tools and the material vessels of culture and how these are integrated into our lives in a direct and porous way. So this is what I wrote. I'm feeling a bit jittery, hot, slightly wired from being tired. I wanted to speak to you in the way that I take pictures highlighting throwaway moments, lingering on moments, <coughs> turning them into sketches, turning them into paintings. Leather makes me think of tongues in dry mouths, thirsty, unquenchable. Leather in the playground, made of fruit, mid-morning sweet hit, earning you points. There's the Chinese version too, hawthorn berry dried fruit discs that don't melt on your tongue. It's too dry. It makes me think of eczema patches that flare up, betraying you by giving away all your innermost feelings. No, I'm not anxious, but the itch says differently. My skin, my body, her body, were once one, but I didn't even really realize until she exited. When that happened, everything was heightened. All I could think about was how my body was being treated by its surroundings, hot, aching, shaking, hungry, thirsty, sweating, cold, and hers the same. She was feeling air for the first time, but what does air feel like? <coughs> if it's noticeable on my skin, it must be sandpaper to hers. She was used to liquid blankets sliding endlessly. Now her dry body is left wanting, but the water I bathe her in is metal. It's first encountering so many other vessels and carriers before touching her. My body was a boat that did that initial filtering for her. She nestled in me, protected just by my being round. Sound sounds different when your face is over, but your ears are underwater. Like it's swollen, or my eardrums are swollen, ballooning out of my ear canal, filling it like plasticine. This last part, I think, encapsulates my relationship to sound. It feels physical, like a blending across my hearing sense and my feeling sense, which in a way is what I think everyone has. When you hear something that makes you instantly have an emotional, bodily or behavioral reaction, it's powerful. I was thinking about whether the definition of this merging or triggering of senses is actually synesthesia, but I wouldn't say that I formally have synesthesia, otherwise don't we all? Maybe more what I do have is a compulsion to see metaphors in everything, an urge to create constant analogies, comparisons, or to read too much into things. A metaphor is a figure of speech that, for rhetorical effect, directly refers to one thing by mentioning another. It might provide clarity or identify hidden similarities between two different ideas. I'm a painter, mostly. And I use painting to record a life that is both constant and constantly in flux, referencing familiar environments and people, often specific to my Chinese-British heritage. Each work serves as a record or a reminder of evolution or growth, <coughs> time progressing, and also a tool for maintaining psychological continuity, not only as an artist, but also a sister, a daughter, a granddaughter, and now a mother. Thinking about metaphors, doesn't the work do just that? It creates a likeness or an analogy or something. My creative process is storytelling, unlocking visceral recollections through the stimulation of the senses. Focusing on the infraordinary and endotic aspects of life, my paintings highlight often overlooked gestures and habits. Using drawn figures, I delve into the minutiae of faces capturing unique elements of their physical appearance, whether it's persistent or transient, acting as indexical time-contingent marks, 
which encapsulate the depicted moments. I want my artworks to be experiential, with sensory references that evoke in you the emotional, psychological and physical context of the moments that had inspired them. I use colours to intertwine taste and sight and smell to create immersive narratives. While abstract elements in my work might convey a sense of freedom and experimentation, like Rory said, they stem from a disciplined approach that I acquired during my musical training. I play the viola. And playing music to some extent requires a high degree of order and control, but it's also the pinnacle of abstraction. And my relationship to music, influenced by my mixed heritage, is reminiscent of a coda. Ever since I was young, I've been surrounded by musicians. My father trained as a violinist at the Sichuan Conservatory of Music in Chengdu. And we would often spend hours visiting friends and colleagues of his. This painting is called You Can Make It Sound Like Horses Racing Over a Pair of Strings. It's a depiction of the feelings I would have when sitting in an unfamiliar room where senses were being stimulated by other musicians. Some of his classmates studied traditional Chinese instruments like the arhu or gu zhen, and some, like him, would play Western instruments like violin and piano. And this painting depicts someone playing the arhu, which is a two-stringed, bowed musical instrument. It has a python skin acting as the primary tone-producing surface of the instrument. The vibration of the skin, it produces a ca characteristic sound, as well as the fact that the bow hairs are strung, sandwiched in between the two strings, as opposed to on top of them, like a violin. This means that the hair of the bow is never separated from the strings, and both sides of the bow hair are used. There isn't a fingerboard, so the player stops the strings by pressing their fingertips down without them touching the neck of the instrument. Specific phrases have stuck in my mind, punctuating these experiences, like how by playing the arhu in a certain way you can make it sound like horses neighing. As you stay with this painting, you notice things like fingers and palms, knees and legs, 
these physical elements of myself play a certain role of grounding. There's the sensation that when you're not in your own space, or you're feeling bored, uncomfortable, frustrated, you look down and see the fine lines in your palms and fingers, and it gives you something smaller and recognisable to focus on. I think as children we're so observant of every crack and tilt in paving stones, or the hair on someone's lip, and the way that their eyes might twitch as they speak. I like to imagine that a younger me listening to this talk would pick it apart, but not for its content, more for the way that I keep using certain words over and over again, and how my intonation means that sentences all sound exactly the same. Attention to detail and how these details make you feel, or how they make you adjust your body in, their, in your seat, how they take up so much space in your mind that you can't help but say it out loud to someone else, or capture it in a piece is the essence of how my work comes about. There's a book by Ben Lerner called 1004 about a fictional author who's also called Ben, who is considering his mortality and legacy, having just received a large publishing advance to write a book, being diagnosed with a life-changing heart condition and the prospect of unconventional fatherhood in a city that might soon be underwater. I started listening to it when my friend and then studio partner, who also happens to be called Ben, recommended it at the start of COVID lockdown. And I think about it a lot now. In particular, I think about this passage, which is in part two of the book. It actually was originally published as a short story in the New York Times a couple of years earlier as the golden vanity. There's this blurring between fact and fiction because in the novel 1004, the fictional author Ben has written a short story, which he's received the publishing advance for to write a book, which is in turn the book that we are actually reading by the real Ben. This redigesting and confusion of reality, chronology and time reminds me of the recapping of stories or events that goes on every day. I'm thinking about the recounting of your day to your flatmate or your partner when you get home, when you suddenly remember the dog you saw on the bus or the attempted retelling of someone else's eventful weekend in a way that is true to their voice, but it also includes your presence somehow. So part two begins with this description of the fictional author Ben in a coffee shop as he's waiting for someone. And I think about this scene quite a lot, so I'm going to read it to you. The author waited for the librarian in the coffee shop on the little commercial strip across from the campus. He sat by the window facing the gothic stone buildings and watched the students walk head down against the wind. Someone said his name because his coffee was ready. He approached the counter and collected the giant cappuccino, noting the flower pattern in the foam. As he started the walk back to his table, the coffee shop door opened, admitting cold air and a middle-aged woman, surely the librarian. She recognized him and waved. His problem was that the coffee required two hands, or at least he had taken it with two hands, one on the cup and one on the saucer, so as not to spill the coffee or upset the foam. He couldn't return her wave. He felt himself scowling at this situation, realizing too late that she would think he was scowling at her. His solution was to look at the cup with exaggerated intensity in the hope that she would understand his dilemma. He walked slowly, eyes fixed on the dissolving flower to the seat beside the window, having ruined everything. But he remembered Dr. Roberts's idea. Roberts had said that when the author found himself in one of these false predicaments and he began to draw shorter and shorter breaths, he should just describe whatever little crisis he just manufactured, what he was feeling to whomever he was meeting in the same winning and humorous way he would recount it afterwards to Roberts. The librarian was at the table she'd inferred was his destination by the time he reached it. He set down the cup and saucer with excessive care. She had a little curly hair he only now saw as at Auburn. He shook the hand she extended and said, I wanted to wave to you when you came in, but I had this coffee in my hands and I was afraid I'd spill it. And then I was afraid that by failing to wave, I appeared unpleasant. And then I felt myself scowling at appearing unpleasant. And then I realized I must really seem unpleasant and had already made a disastrous impression. She laughed as though this were indeed winning and said, you sound like your novel. The anxiety <coughs> dissipated, but into flatness. 
and he spilt some of the coffee, lifting it to his lips. I love the unimportant but really heavily described passage of his internal monologue, which is then repeated for us through an attempted humorous explanation to another character. This retelling is prompted by a reference to someone's advice to him. It's like a constant pointing out of absurdity, both internal and observed, which sits amongst descriptions of larger, more serious events, which gets you very interested in that person and what he has to say. I think what interests me most about this is that there seems to be a folding over of time onto itself. These people and the things associated with them seem to exist in multiple times at once, a blend of projected futures and recollections and moments that trigger these. In an interview with the New York Times, Ben Lerner said, I think the decision to name a protagonist, the author, actually preceded the story itself, or the decision was the germ of the story. I was interested in how that name, that placeholder for a name, would allow me to write in the third person and the first person simultaneously. The author is simultaneously confronting biological time, his mortality, and what you could call archival time, the prospect of some posthumous literary life, or the foreclosure of that prospect. I think these competing orders of temporality destabilize the author's sense of time, of his present tense, and that the story both describes and enacts that temporal confusion at various points. Each of us is constantly striving to reorganize mere chronology in some meaningful form, some meaningful pattern, to narrate our pasts in a way that makes a future thinkable. Having recently entered the realm of par parenthood, I've had to become used to a shift in daily life where observations, projections, and reflections are constant. I'm making work which considers how, for me, motherhood has become a way of measuring time, how it's spent, how to reclaim it, how to present it in physical terms. It's a form of indexical mark making. It was ever since one of my tutors at the Slade talked about indexical mark making that I find it everywhere. Everything to do with how you live your life seems to be an index of you and your work. If I'm painting on the floor, there might be an accidental footstep on the canvas, additional dust and particles picked up off the studio, fingerprints from when I tried to blend the paint together more, or a change in color palette to reflect the change in season, a shift to working smaller to enable easier transportation of work when a residency comes to an end. And more than this, a certain speed to the work, because I can only get to the studio one or two days a week. All of these factors exist in the work, sometimes overtly, sometimes invisibly. But I think that this additional information we build around ourselves and others when we participate in their art is allowing the work to act as a symbol of that person. There's this phenomenon called pareidolia, which is described as when the brain arranges random stimuli into a significant image or a sound or a tendency for our perception to impose a meaningful interpretation onto something vague so that we can detect an object or meaning where there is none. It happens all the time. We see animals in cloud formations or faces in houses, hearing music in the whirring of an escalator or alternative words to a song when it's played in reverse. Essentially, that's what it feels like when you're doing, that's what it feels like you're doing when making work, which is simultaneously abstracted and representative. In my paintings, I don't often allow an image to exist on just one plane. Whether this is a practiced habit or an impulse that I can't help but fulfill, it means that often each painting is an amalgamation of many paintings and drawings and photographs and bodies and places and words, histories, voices, tastes, textures, and times. When I'm making something, there's always the spillover of the main work, which sometimes exists as written notes or discarded photographs, or excess paint dumped onto an additional canvas so as not to waste it. These overflows, they're like slow leaks beginning just as small scraps of mess, but eventually taking up just as much room as the original intended painting does. By the time I finished, it feels like I've simultaneously created something concrete and complete, as well as disintegrated and cluttered. I think it comes across as being like a calm chaos, 
not dissimilar to the feeling of entering into this room for this lecture from the Elephant and Castle roundabout. You find yourself sitting here in a dark room with a big projector flashing images across your pupils. Semi-transparent, multiple layered reflections and light glares make indistingu indistinguishable the rows of people that are the audience. That is until the spotlight moment momentarily swings around and through smoke lights up the expression on one of these faces and renders them a character in the performance. We, as members of multiple audiences, are playing out a version of our lives whilst watching ourselves from behind <coughs> distorting layers of lights, colours and smoke. Thinking about what we call the people that experience our artwork, we often say the audience. The audience makes sense here, where we are within the context of sound artists. The word comes from the Latin audencia or audire, which means to hear. But how does that translate when looking at a painting? Beautiful, intimate theatre, but stick to the stalls. D10 really is a great seat. Sixth row from the stage and bang in the middle. I'd avoid the first two rows. You'll be craning your neck if you're seated there. A review of the Garrick Theatre from the TripAdvisor. This zone of being in an audience when we are actively participating but seemingly invisible at the same time, a midpoint between the performers on stage and the public outdoors makes me think of in-between spaces and the significance of them. This is a recording of me playing whilst walking around the studio building I was in at the time. It goes between rooms and stairwells, and I was playing almost like a stream of consciousness, a mixture of improvising and snippets of songs, rhymes and pieces that interrupted my thought.
sometimes I take photos as a starting point and I segment my paintings into different but most often related storylines. There are regularly, regularly recurring drawn and heavily outlined figures layered over and in between more solid of this world objects, simultaneously present and fleeting. In some ways there are references to memory without explicitly being memories. I don't like to describe work as being about memories, even if they play an important part in them, because I think it feels restricting to label something that clearly. It pigeonholes us into certain key words which would make the work easily searchable in an archive, but perhaps detracting from certain nuances. Instead, I aim to leave the work in a state where before you can pinpoint exactly what is being said or shown, where or even who, the image dissolves, leaving you in an in-between space. In-between spaces can still be physical spaces, if thinking about standing in a lift between floors, journeying to somewhere either above or below or on ground. Windows existing somewhere both internal and external, partially on a practical level, as a source of light and contributor of sight and mental well-being, and on a more abstracted level, as an implacable barrier or reliable shield. I gave birth in late December and spent the first few months of my daughter's life in what felt like relentless darkness. I stationed myself permanently at the window, which itself was framed in daylight bulb fairy lights, on 24 hours a day to trick my over-anxious, over-tired body that the season had in fact transitioned early. Windows are useful. They bring light, they bring sound, air, a sense of time, a welcome visual distraction, when I picture myself positioned immobile at the window, trapped under a sleeping baby, glowing so bright we're almost blue against the dark sky, I imagine the glass framing us. I was recently writing an application, and during the research I came across a Chinese writer and painter called Ling Shuhua, who, through her letters to Virginia Woolf, is introduced as a part of the Bloomsbury constellation of writers and artists. She enters the Bloomsbury Circle through her relationship with Julian Bell, the nephew of Virginia Woolf and son of Vanessa Bell. It excited me to learn that a Chinese woman was a part of such a significant avant-garde literary community in, Eng in England. There's a book about the romance of Ling Shuhua and Julian Bell, which is titled Lily Briscoe's Chinese Eyes by Patricia Lawrence. This title is a direct reference to a description of a fictional painter, Lily Briscoe, in one of Virginia Woolf's books, The Lighthouse. The passage describing this fictional painter says, with her little Chinese eyes and her puckered up face, she would never marry. One could not take her painting very seriously. She was an independent little creature and Mrs. Ramsay liked her for it. So remembering her promise, she bent her head. This is the character Lily's first appearance in the book, and she's introduced through the perspective of another character, Mrs. Ramsey, who happens to be a woman sitting behind a window, comfortably in her home with her baby son. They are both having their portrait painted by Lily, who's positioned on the other side of the window, symbolically an outsider, faced with the unpredictability of the exposed outdoor elements. This character Lily is not Chinese, but the description of her labels her as having little Chinese eyes, a facial feature which is apparently undesirable and therefore she will be unable to marry, adding to her depiction of being an outsider. My Chinese heritage is important to me. I speak solely Mandarin to my daughter, like my father with me. My black hair and her golden curls feel like symbols of our Chineseness. Me half and her a quarter. With me, strangers assume my ability to speak Mandarin. With her, they will be impressed. She has my eyes, which in themselves seem to change all the time, sometimes flitting between being single or double-lidded, undecided, in between. <laughs>
My Chinese heritage is important to me, but as Elsa Tuet Rosenberg, who is a queer, multiracial Jewish and Chinese woman of color said in an interview, I sometimes feel like people see me as being a bridge between two worlds because I'm mixed race. But honestly, I feel much more that my parents were the bridge more than I am. Sometimes it feels more like rivers running parallel than anything intersecting. I think that description of being rivers running alongside each other, flowing away from and towards something endlessly is so accurate. And it makes me think actually of the Ursula K. Le Guin text I was talking about at the start of the lecture, about carriers and vessels, things for holding and for transporting, linking one place to another, not necessarily by making them meet, but through constant shifting movement. In some ways, this is how I think about my work beyond my painting practice. Running parallel to the making is Same Gallery. Over six years ago now, my family, my partner and I founded Same Gallery. We're a non-profit independent space for contemporary art in South London and are committed to research-led educational and collaborative exchanges. When we opened in 2017, the aim was to create a space that allowed for cross-disciplinary experimentation with a particular focus on emerging artists. Mainly, we were trying to get as much happening there as we possibly could with performance nights, exhibitions, sound, workshops, film screenings, food, reading groups. We did a bit of everything and there was a very fast turnaround. And since then, the artist-led approach and ethos has been maintained. The team has grown and we've managed to get some success in public funding. Um, the programme is now formed of four or five exhibitions a year, which run for about two months each, and a whole host of public programming alongside them. In 2021, when things were opening up again after COVID, and we were having people back in the space for in-person shows, we presented a solo exhibition by London and Beijing-based artist and researcher, Lisa Chang Li. The exhibition, Symphony Zero, was formed around a project by the artist, that had used the objectivity of algorithms to examine and challenge the binary opposition between technology and nature. Part of the exhibition was the work Serenade of the Woods, where through data analysis, the rhythm of plants in the breeze is read and then transformed into musical scores. The technical backbone of this project is an algorithm specifically designed with a variation of musical scales, including birdsong. The algorithm is programmed to analyze the movements of plants from the video recordings and from these observations compose music. Each plant is associated with a musical instrument that reflects its synesthetic qualities and each plant's motion in the breeze is translated into a unique musical score which is then played by musicians. These scales enable the algorithm to process the natural movements captured in everyday life, translating them into a symphony orchestrated by nature itself. The project culminated in an audiovisual installation and a live performance within Same Gallery. Bei Bei Wang, a unique percussionist with a background of both classical and traditional Chinese percussion, sat behind the translucent screen projection and played together with the orchestra of plants. The performance felt like a sincere ensemble, a collaboration between Bei Bei and the plants. And I have a clip of her playing for you here.
percussionist here, Bebe Wong, has previously been commissioned by the London-based music collective Tangram, which was co-directed by Alex Ho and Rocky Sun Keting. As part of their commission series, Tangram Voices, we hosted two more performances at Sam May Gallery. One of the commissioned performances was by the percussionist Angela Wai Nok Hoi. She presented a program exploring the beautiful, ordinary qualities of today and brought together artists Neil Luck, James Larter, and Jasmine Kent Rodgman. Angela's performances explore and expound the boundaries of music, performance, and sound art. She's passionate about the creative process and experimenting with different art forms. In recent years, she started to create work which often engages with political references and themes of identity from both places that she calls home, Hong Kong and the UK, embedded, embedded within the strange and beautiful sound worlds that she creates. This is an extract from the Same performance where Angela and James are improvising to an animation projected onto the ceiling. Thank you. 
So we currently have a very evocative exhibition on by Libyan artist Tofik Naz, in particular focusing on the troubled history of the Great Man-Made River, which was a government-led infrastructure system initiated in the late 1980s by the then Libyan leader Gaddafi. Tofik's exhibition turns away from the linear understandings of historical events and collective trauma that position history within the limited framework of perception, inspired by the morphology of germinating plants as a symbol of resilience and hope. It would be great to see you at the gallery, and we have a couple of events coming up as part of the exhibition. Next week, I will also be showing some work from Thursday till Sunday at Good Eye Projects in Hammersmith to mark the end of the residency I've been on there. I'd love to see you there or at Sami Gallery where I am at the rest of the week, so come along. And this is quite a long time to talk for, so I'm just going to finish off with a poem by Osama Alomar, who is a Syrian short, short story writer, a poet and an essayist. He writes in the very short story genre and in a way where the focus shifts smoothly and slightly so that by the end the subject turns out to be something other than what we expected. Often, he skillfully uses realism together with a deep emotional truth to create a fantasy which is acutely heartfelt. So this is called a circle. As she fell from the edge of the table, the drop of oil asked herself, will I be imprinted on the ground in the shape of a square or a triangle or a rectangle? No, no, she said, a pentagon would be best. After going back and forth over this question, she said to herself with a sigh, maybe best to just leave it to nature. Immediately upon hitting the ground, she assumed the form of a circle, as did all different kinds of drops that followed her. The stars and planets and the whole cycle of life looked upon her meaningfully. Thank you. do some questions. Um, has anybody got a question to start us off with? Anyone got a burning desire? Yeah, okay. Hey. Hey. Uh, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, I'll start off, which is, um, it's not a specific question, but it's more a curiosity about the use of the term synesthesia, um, because you mentioned it twice um, in the talk. And I was just wondering if you could maybe expand upon what you mean and, and why it's maybe a problematic term, um, I guess for you, and also in terms of your work curating Sanmai. San mm. Yeah, I, I always have this thing where I almost um, don't believe that it is a thing, that synesthesia is a thing, because I have a friend who would, he kind of like disclosed to me, like, oh, you know, I'm synesthetic, and we were at a concert, and he was like, I'm seeing all this stuff. And I, I don't know, I kind of, yeah, I almost didn't believe that that was the case, and I don't, I'm not sure what it is, I have no kind of, real scientific knowledge of it and I mean I don't think I have it but I guess I just um, I always think of it like someone saying oh when I listen to music it makes me feel things it kind of it feels like such a kind of blanket statement that actually probably everyone experiences um, in some shape or form like a kind of like a spectrum of feeling. So when I was mentioning it, it was, um, yeah, trying to think about, does that term actually encapsulate what it is to kind of feel or see or kind of taste things when you're hearing music and that sort of merging of different senses? Does that term actually encapsulate it or is it just kind of like an easy fix to title it that. And I kind of meant the same thing when I was talking about memories, because I feel so often in um, 
kind of people's descriptions of work, either their own or others. There's like memories comes up and it'll be like, oh yeah, their work's about memory or my work's about memory. And sim similarly, I kind of feel like that term memory also, it feels too easy almost to label something with that. Um, yeah, so it's just, I guess it's also about language then, this kind of, it's like confusion about what it means for something to have a definition and to have a label um, and a lot of the time I think the things that maybe I'm really interested in hearing about or reading about are things that are a bit more difficult to be labelled with with a kind of term um, yeah so like Ben Lerner's writing talking about all this kind of like anxiety and um, like awkwardness I kind of like that he just talks for ages about nothing a lot of the time um yeah really ordinary things and synesthesia maybe feels like it's almost too grand uh, an idea in my head so that's how I feel about it yeah I also find it grand and for some reason I think I affiliate it with like 1950s and 60s like medical experiments mm for some reason, so I, w I was just interested, yeah, to hear your <coughs> take on it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, no, I, re I really like what you say about things in between mm. coexisting sensory stuff. I think it's also because quite a lot, like even when I, I think I searched synesthesia in Google to find out how to spell it, and it was like some of the images that come up are just so obvious. It's like so. Um, what you'd expect someone to put next to the word synesthesia, like a um, someone, and in their it's like a head, and in their brain there's loads of colours, and then there's like music notes next to it. And I'm like, surely that that kind of is, yeah, it's too simple a an idea. And I guess it maybe it's because we can't really see inside people's brains, or or maybe we can. I I. Uh, <laughs> Not sure the science behind it, but yeah, it's something about like how it's depicted. I think through imagery or film or words. Yeah, it's also seen as something a bit like woo as yeah. well. <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. But no, I th I think just to I guess to respond to your work, I really appreciated the way that you convey multiple sensations and impressions and feelings and psychologies in the work. So. Yeah, that was really nice. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. I've got I've got some, so I, I I'm gonna go next, and then if anyone else wants to ask one, please just stick your hand up. Um. When I asked Annie if I could pick some people to do this. I sort of straight away knew that I really wanted to ask you to do one and then I sort of had this funny like thing in my mind where I was like is it okay to ask someone who's predominantly practices like predominantly painting to do a sound art sketch I was like is it unfair to you is it weird for students I, I just like was kind of asking myself the question of like is this but it felt like a, a really good thing to do and I think it is a really good thing to do and it was it all kind of makes a lot of sense now that you've actually done it as well because I think when like the first one of the first bits you were talking about was I'm not quoting I'm sort of heavily misquoting but it's like capturing small moments in your paintings which instantly made me think of like a field recording because I guess when you're recording when you're recording an environment as opposed to just listening to one you often hear the smaller things a lot louder. You hear them amplified because you're amplifying everything. And and then I, I was instantly like, oh yeah, the paintings are, are like, yeah, it all, it all sort of made sense. And then a little bit later on, um, when you were talking about the layers, I was, it, it sort of dawned on me that for me, your paintings are a bit like musical compositions or at least like musical compositions that I like where there are 
different temporalities happening at the same time and different layers of things. Mm. So I guess a question out of all of these thoughts is, have you ever thought about one of your paintings as being similar to a mu musical composition? Has that feeling ever come up? Mm. I did have a, I also had the same thoughts as you when you asked me if I wanted to do the talk. And I was kind of um, nervous about like, oh, do, do I need to really tailor it? Like talk just about sound. And then I had this whole stage where I only picked out paintings where I had like painted music things in like notes or I don't know, things to do with music. And then I was like, obviously you're all artists as well. You're not like, just obsessed with sound and nothing else like everyone's references kind of um cross over and blend and i think with music for me i um i kind of personally also i'm always questioning like oh how can i you know bring the music things i do or the same things i do into my painting and that was like i guess a few years when i was studying where i really felt like they had to you know, be the same thing and otherwise it wasn't representative of who I was. And then I kind of realised that it really, it really doesn't. And I have friends who they're like amazing dancers and also artists and they don't necessarily have to do a dance performance as part of their art. Like they're these kind of separate, separate parts of you and your identity. Um, but I think what does come across in the paintings, kind of like you said, with the layering and with the sort of discipline of like a lot of the time when you're painting, you're kind of just in a room by yourself and most of the time being like, what, what's, why would anyone want me to do this? Like, what's the point of this? No one's gonna experience it unless I like, I don't know, put the painting up somewhere. But I think a lot of it really mirrors the whole process of like, for me, learning the violin or viola and just like having to do my scales and having to practice all the time and kind of like going through stages of really not wanting to and it feeling like homework. And then eventually realizing that that kind of almost like conditioning and rehearsing every day, um, it kind of becomes routine and it feels almost like you're a daily sketch that you're doing or notes that everyone kind of types on their phone. Um, so yeah, I really, even if sometimes in the paintings there isn't like direct mu um, music references, I do think of it as, um, yeah, almost the same as picking up the instrument and practicing it for a couple of, even like a couple of minutes a day um, and seeing where that takes it. Um, and then also, like the bit of recording that I played where I was in the stairwell. When I was listening back to that, I was, because it's quite random and kind of doesn't really go anywhere. And that was partially what I was trying to work out. It's like, oh, where I was in the kind of stairwell of the Slade and it's really echoey there. And it almost sounds like you put um, like a reverb on it. Um, and then it kind of felt like just a stream of consciousness, which was kind of like how I actually started this talk because I was thinking like, oh, how do I, how do I make this relevant? And I just started writing and then everything kind of came into it. So yeah, as artists, sound artists or painters or sculptors, I think a lot of the time our method of working kind of translates across all these different mediums in the same way. So like if Rory was to make a sculpture, you could probably still tell Rory had made it because we know your sound work. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's yeah, I think that's kind of like the really good thing about it. And I, I, the first thing I thought of actually was your, I think it was in your degree show, the painting you did, that had loads of musical notation, mm. like fanning out of it. But, and I mean, I mean that painting specifically. It's kind of hard to talk in a room full of people that might not have seen the painting, but that was quite like a. I think when I saw that, I don't know, I kind of saw a more exciting version of music than a lot of the music that I hear on a daily basis mm -hmm. like in that painting. And then the paintings that you showed today, it's still, yeah, this 
idea of music still, and music and sound still came through really strongly. Mm. Um, and it made me think that it's funny that quite often people will put labels on different mediums as being like time-based or, you know, I can't, not time-based, you know, like mm. people be like, oh, sound works are, are time-based because, well, yeah, but the paintings are kind of time, I mean, like they are time-based, like the, anything, is, like, anything that takes that amount of time to make. Mm. And you do a really good job of showing that process, actually, mm. of like all of the time that goes into it. Mm. And it takes a lot of time to look at the paintings. Mm. So maybe that's another reason that I get this this sort of similar sense that I do to sound mm. when I look at your paintings. That's kind of also um, when I was also thinking about like yeah sound or film as time based media, and then that kind of brought me onto that whole indexical mark making thing where like when you're making field recordings and you hear um, you can probably hear like what trousers you're wearing if you're wearing waterproof trousers and it's there and then you're like okay it was raining that day and you kind of like build this whole um, narrative around it that is relevant to the setting and the kind of same happens with sculpture especially with like found material sculpture you kind of you can work out where what sort of environment someone's been in and with painting um, yeah the if they've painted on the floor then there's evidence of that and um, yeah, those are the sort of clues that I like to look out for or listen out for um, in everything. And in some ways, back to the Ben Lerner thing, um, you can kind of read a novel that is a bit more grandiose or kind of skims over small details. But if you're looking for those small details, you can still kind of pick them out. Um, yeah, so then, yeah, in that way, painting, I think, is very time based as well and yeah, you can pick it apart, find your clues. Yeah. The indexical mark making thing is a bit like, uh, it's like one of those things that once you've thought about it and seen it, you kind of, yeah, you can't undo it. Yeah. And I find I get quite obsessed with it. Mm. I think like 90% of my, of the sound that goes into any composition I make now is like, is that I'm just, I'm just always trying to, listening back to recordings, I'm always trying to pick out the bits where there's just this, this mark, mm. it's really cool. Um, you, you mentioned a word that I've written down that I'd maybe like to know more about if you, if you can, but mm. also if you can't, don't worry. But pareidolia, is that it? Oh yeah. Yeah, so I kind of didn't know there was a word for it, but yeah. Um, yeah, the whole like seeing a face in the front of a car or and I think that kind of related to what you just said, once you start seeing things like that, then you kind of can't stop and it becomes a bit like a imprint on your mind where like wherever you look, you kind of see a face. Um, and yeah, as, I guess I came across that word and was like, oh, there's a word for it. And <laughs> that's cool. And thinking about like how that relates to metaphors or similes where you kind of see it everywhere. A lot of the time people say what they want to say, not directly, but through, you know, describing something else, either because it feels a bit too awkward to say it directly, or I don't know, they very creative mind. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just, um, I like the, the idea of pareidolia not necessarily having to be visual because I think we, we we've jumped to the examples of seeing animals in the cloud formations and things but there are instances especially with within sound where you hear something that isn't necessarily kind of created with the intention to be performed as a sound piece or as music but you can make it that um, and I actually have a very clear memory of you, Rory. At, I think it's London Bridge Station, where one of the escalators are, and it has this like really fast kind of beep, like high pitched beep sound. I remember you like stopping in your tracks and being like, 
I've got to record this. And it was like, um, every time I get there, I go there, I hear it, like it's still there. <laughs> and it's quite nice as a, um, it's almost like a jingle or something, like London Bridge Station's jingle. Um, yeah, it's like those things exist all across our city and the world. And they're just like, they're waiting to be picked out, just like metaphors or similes are. Yeah, we're always up to business. <laughs> Yeah, that, I mean, like the. It's just made me think about uh, Rashad Becker's music because I always hear animals in that, even though it's all, to my knowledge, synthesized, and I always really clearly hear like farm animals, <laughs> and I, and I can't unhear it. Yeah, it's cool. I never knew there was a word for it, so mm. it's it's very nice to to make a note. All right, has anyone else got a question before I move on to my to my next one? Oh yeah. Hey, thank you. That was um, that was really inspiring. Thank you. Um, I thought it was interesting that well, it's got me thinking about form, and I thought it was interesting that um, uh, that these Thursday afternoon lectures kind of often have this like a, a kind of. Uh, I think we've come to expect a certain like form to them <laughs> that you kind of went against the grain um, because it wasn't really like a often people will do like I did this work here's some picture here's some sound and then another one and often it's chronological or something chronological and you, you didn't really do that which I thought was very refreshing um, and I thought it was also interesting that you, as you were talking about Ben Lerner's 1004 and the, the author um, you sort of um, you're also showing us these images, and you're kind of uh, not really telling us necessarily. You weren't saying, "Oh, this is this image." You were just kind of get like n assuming that we would assume or or, or get what, why they were there, what the meaning behind them was. Mm -hmm. um, and just generally, I think there were, especially when it comes to analogy and like metaphoric process um, and pareidolia, uh, just these. These diff I felt like we were touching on different ways in which uh, artists can uh, play with expectations and disrupt those expectations. Um, and yeah, if you, I'd love to just hear a bit more about uh, how how you play with form. And also, maybe I don't. Are you the curator of this gallery that you run as well? Yeah. So maybe if you could tell us a bit more about that as well mm. as a curator, that'd be really interesting. Mm. Yeah. Um, it was kind of like a very conscious decision that I made. I was like, I do not want to put up a picture and be like, I did this first, this is what it's about, and then I did this, and then I graduated and I did this. It was like, because I kind of remembered going to lectures a bit like this when I was studying and always finding like, when when it was this sort of chronological, like you said, um, timeline of the artist's work, I felt a bit like, I'd been cheated because I was like I could find this online like I know I could find when you did this and where you were there was no sort of mystery to it um and there was a couple of people who had done sort of more of a performance and that felt really refreshing um and a couple of people who'd written more like an essay and they basically read the essay out and that was sort of the form I decided to do because I haven't written an essay or anything as long as this for probably four or five years or something but I was trying to think of a way to almost like get around some sort of performance anxiety where uh, it's like writing a script for yourself about yourself and it does feel like a little bit like the author in Ben Lerner's book and him being an author and it all sort of clicked into place and seemed to make sense. But yeah, when writing the talk, the form sort of come came about through writing it. Like I didn't know I was going to be referencing Ben Lerner or all these things. Um, so it felt very, like I was kind of surprised by it as well. And yeah, it almost didn't feel necessary like I was in charge of curating this talk kind of similarly how with Sam A Gallery so I'm sort of one of the curators one of the directors or founders but 
and the way that we work as a team isn't so kind of hierarchical in that we actually have an open call process so um, usually in springtime uh, we basically just open up for proposals so anyone whether they're a designer or an artist um, they can submit a proposal for an exhibition and we don't ask for people to submit like I want to show this work in the space we ask for like how they're actually going to use the space like what do they imagine it being and is it a whole kind of installation is it dark is there like a kind of idea for a public program alongside it so in that way it feels very like it's a kind of mutual process so when we select the artists we choose about four a year for the next year um, we then begin the process of kind of helping them refine their exhibition proposal a bit and um, apply for funding for it and things like that and because our team there's about six or seven of us but everyone on everyone on the team is part-time and is also an artist or a writer or a designer curator so for everyone it kind of feels like it's this extended part of our own practice and we bring bring that to it um, which makes it feel like this very mutual experience and by the end of the exhibition it feels like you've kind of built it together with the artist even though it is their proposal and their work and everything um, but that's it's been interesting seeing how that's developed over the past six years that we've been open because when we first started it was very ad hoc and very like we had kind of recently graduated there were lots of people around who were excited and had things that they wanted to show and so we kind of just did that and there wasn't really a plan but each it felt like each week there was just something new happening and it was really tiring <laughs> because you just have no idea what's going to happen next and um, but it, that was what was so exciting about it as well it kind of set the foundations for it to be a gallery space it's not a commercial gallery like we hardly sell anything there is a shop that we try to <laughs> push and sell little books from and things but um, yeah it set the precedence for it to be this space that could be a bit more um, more about showing works that are maybe in progress or you know part one of three of this final project and yeah I'm just glad that over the six years that kind of ethos has stayed there and um, yeah I'm kind of still intrigued or excited about where it's going to go we're currently like this week selecting the people for next year and it's always really um, it's quite enlightening actually because you do see a theme forming through all of these applications you're like oh there's a lot of people seem to be making work that touches on ideas of care for example and it made me think like oh maybe maybe there's just not enough spaces for care in our society and people are feeling this kind of gap there and they need it um, so the whole structure and form of Sam May Gallery is very much kind of created by the artists who submit their proposals and show there. Thanks. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask you about your artistry and um, referring to things you said earlier about the framework uh, becoming like a pigeonhole and also, um, yeah, that was the main thing I was thinking about, that you want, you're trying to go in between or beyond categories um, and you kind of express how the linguistic frameworks put onto the work can be um, reductive so I'm wondering how how then you go about kind of existing publicly as mm -hmm. an artist um, and try to engage with institutions or generally like the the art worlds that exist that we kind of uh, we need to be part of to mm. 
to like socialize and meet people um, is it quite has it been quite a natural kind of flowing uh, maintenance of, of your values or has has it been difficult to know what's the right step or decision when it comes to your artistry mm. I, yeah I think about this all the time because um, so often it feels like I don't know the people that you see who are showing a lot in exhibitions and things they have their kind of house style and it is important I think to have some sort of kind of thing that's recognisable to you and I, I sort of flip and flap between like do I need to do that do I, I kind of feel a draw to like I could I could kind of paint in the same way and make paintings that I guess are in some way successful but there's just like this fear almost in myself of kind of boredom and um, knowing like expecting knowing exactly what I'm going to be making next and even if there's sort of nuances and differences in terms of the kind of research research I'm doing alongside it if the visible outcome felt to me too similar to previous works I think I would just personally lose interest in it and therefore assume that other people would too but it is something that I still kind of constantly think about think about and try and kind of make a decision about because like you said it is hard when if you're writing endless applications for um, exhibitions or residencies or things and you feel like each time it's a complete different work or complete different process it's kind of exhausting and it's also quite confusing I think for the people reading the applications because at least when we're at San May Gallery when we're reading them we do kind of go onto that person's website or um, social media and look at their past work and try and kind of build a picture around this specific work that they've presented to us so I do that in my San May mind and then sometimes I find when I'm in my kind of painting mind I almost forget about that and find it quite hard to uh, yeah make the two relevant to each other um, but uh, I would say that when you're personally making the work it might seem to you as if like oh this is completely different to my previous thing I made but from the outside it's it's actually maybe quite similar <laughs> and I think it's just because we're so close to the work that we're making daily and like so used to it that when you make a tiny adjustment like oh maybe I'll use a bit of green there instead you're like wow <laughs> groundbreaking but no one else is necessarily thinking that and I think it's personally what kind of keeps me moving forward and excited about making is to try and almost challenge myself to make work that to me feels kind of like it's a group show so I would present all my paintings in one room together but want it to almost look like it's three or four different people there because it's like keeping you on your toes and yeah keeping it exciting for yourself and eventually that excitement will come across to two other people um, but yeah it's not necessarily like a very natural easy thing I think for me to to do that I still battle with it or think about it all the time yeah that's r that's really interesting what mm. you said I feel like it's I guess it's like a trying to maintain or protect that um, creative practice mm. that uh, when it becomes public maybe it, it starts to feed back mm. into your um, do, do you in that sense does has it changed for you this kind of creativity um, from being young and now like get like growing up mm. like from being a child to being like an adult maybe mm. I think like I when I look back at older paintings or kind of older artist statements that I've written myself I have I still have that sort of like slight oh god I can't believe it, that's what I thought I was doing but I just love the fact that the same is going to happen to me in 10 years time I'm like oh I can't believe that's what I thought was like 
that's what I thought was it and that's almost what I want to keep and I think I was talking earlier about um, when you're a child and you're just like so uninterested or maybe this is just me but so uninterested in the content of the class that you're sitting in at school like all you can think about is the fact that your teacher like I don't know always wears that same top and you just get kind of obsessed with that and um, distracted constantly distracted and yeah that kind of essence I think remains even through up till adulthood adulthood and yeah especially now that I have a child I feel like it's like happening all over again and yeah everything I'm like seeing everything repeated almost or imagining oh when I was one maybe I also thought that did that so yeah I do refer back to uh, can't use the word memory because I said I don't like it <laughs> I refer back to uh, past selves a lot and probably that means I'm also referring to future selves um, yeah thank you can I ask a question um, firstly thank you so much that was such a beautiful kind of journey and I really liked how you yeah, didn't give us the trad artist talk but that you still kind of were generous enough to um, allow us to follow but then also kind of open up into these really nice kind of poetic spaces um, and I'm very I think it's really great to invite someone who is kind of predominantly a painter to speak especially because your work has so much connection with with music but also writing and, and other kind of art forms and I think that is definitely I think how we keep the space alive and how hopefully we continue to inspire students so it was really great on that front as well um, I also think it enables kind of comparisons to be made that are really like potentially important for our practices even if most people here are sound artists and sound designers um, and there's something about how you are focusing on these kind of trivialities or these kind of mundane experiences like the um, the Ben Lerner book that you were referencing and there's something there about field recording and that just kind of in itself being quite prosaic and quite yeah capturing like the everyday um and maybe making that into something else um so anyway those were just my responses to other people's comments as well but i actually really wanted to hear more about the um chinese woman who was involved with the virginia wolf kind of circle um more about her because that's fascinating mm. and also what kind of what is the project that you're kind of hoping to do um, based on that? Mm. Okay. Yeah, I'm also kind of like just at the start of that, but when I came across it, it was just like, whoa, this is, like this feels very like a secret that I don't know why it was kept for so long, but I think obviously a lot of people do know about her. It's just, I didn't. But um, the reason I came across it was because I was um, applying for a residency that was based kind of in Camden-ish area and I was just researching the area to try and make the proposal kind of relevant to it because often that's what we look for in the Zambe proposals and uh, how did I even come up I think uh, yeah I'm not sure like the exact line of um, searching that I found but I just came across these letters that had been that Lily um, that Ling Shuhua had written <laughs> and they were on the British Library website and they're kind of all scanned in there and they're all written in English and um, it just, she just seemed like this quite kind of mysterious figure that was somehow really embedded in the whole Bloomsbury group which has its own whole identity and kind of obsession around like a lot of people 
um, I went to the Charleston house and uh, some other people who were on the tour with me knew like every single painting there and to me they just seemed a bit like I don't know like a random still life that someone might have done in their spare 10 minutes and then it was put on the details and all of the kind of dates and times of when things happened and I guess I, it's a bit like a rabbit hole, like I'm just right on the surface level and I didn't get that residency that I applied to but I was so, so excited about the fact that I'd even found that as something to clutch onto um, and thinking about windows and it was a bit of that kind of spiralling thing again where I just found Ling Shuhua and this book about her and then it referred to another book and then there was like Chinese reference in that book and I was like whoa kind of <laughs> almost couldn't contain it and just had to start writing it down and as I was writing it down it kind of starts giving me ideas about windows and paintings and things so yeah I don't her relationship with Julian Bell didn't last um, it was quite tumultuous that's what I know so far but uh, yeah, I'm excited to read further into it and see how it relates to other sort of um, people of East Asian backgrounds who have migrated to the UK. And yeah, it feels relevant because that's what my dad did, but uh, in a different way in that it was actually first my mum who went to China and she was studying Chinese and met him there and then he came back here and was someone who didn't know the language and didn't know anyone apart from her but just like his um, personality because he is a performer and a violinist he kind of he it was fun he just it didn't matter he just joined a orchestra or joined a quartet or something and just started playing and then yeah it feels kind of stereotypical like oh the music was his language because he couldn't speak English but um yeah, it's interesting, I think, for me to try and compare maybe his experience or the experience of other people who are part of, I don't know, like the Hackney Chinese Community Centre, for example, and compare that with someone who, back in time, was kind of doing the same thing, but so embedded within the literary community, which to me feels like quite a big, quite a big thing. like. I'm even too nervous to write something um, because I get the words wrong or, yeah. So that's very surface level, but it's kind of, I'm excited to look into it and people can look on the British Library website if they want to see those letters because they're quite, they're quite kind of endearing. It's like a pen pal relationship and it's nice to get an insight into that. Thanks so much. On the back of that, would you consider that you have like a, a research practice or like how does research happen for you? Does it normally that you've made a piece of work and then you find something and then they feel connected and then that sort of flows onto other things or do you, do you like seek, I guess you just said that you sort this, you were seeking things out for the mm -hmm. residency in Camden but yeah I don't know maybe if you could talk a bit more about if there is a, f a formal practice of research or whether it's just stuff that happens by being interested in mm. what's going on. I think a lot of the time I'm not necessarily seeking it out but um, it kind of pops up and if I find it interesting then it kind of sticks and um, when I'm thinking about, it's almost, I don't know, it makes me think of when someone shares a mixtape or something with you and what they think are like, oh, these are the best tracks on this, might not be the ones that you take, you kind of find something else that you like from it and mm -hmm. then you don't do anything with it but it exists on this USB stick or something for, for ages and then you come across it and then it slots into just like life things that you're thinking about at that time. Um, so I've always been quite a, um, 
don't know how to say it because it's not lazy but it's I'm not necessarily like that intentional with like the music that I choose to listen to for example it like I prefer to have a radio on that might sometimes be playing like really horrible like Ed Sheeran but then I kind of like suddenly think like maybe I love this I don't know <laughs> but I love the like letting the things kind of wash over me and then suddenly one day I'm like wow I know all the lyrics to his song and kind of having to think about it more like does this mean that you know he's this big kind of research topic that I need to go into and then you can discard things but um yeah I think the process is a bit less like the Camden residency one where I'm like come on I need to find something and a bit more like thinking things can kind of wash over me and jump out and then eventually 10 years down the line become something that I look at yeah it's funny how things like spread like what was that song that you were really into uh, there was like a song you were really into a few years ago that had organ and singing in oh, it yeah, and you heard it, it on into you Hammond song by the roaches yeah yeah and I remember that <laughs> song slowly making its way through our friendship group yeah. and everyone listening to it all the time and then I felt awkward because every time someone played it I felt like they had to look at me and be like <laughs> You you found that and I'm like oh I don't want people to think I'm obsessed with it but I kind of am. <laughs> but I think that's that kind of like yeah I'd sort of written a qu I'd, I'd sort of written a question about this actually because I feel like a th two weeks ago Luciano Majori gave a lecture and well it wasn't really a lecture we did it in conversation. Mm with Eka, him and myself and I realised when talking to him he's someone that I see like most like maybe a couple of days a week that we never talk about practice like we never talk about what we do we just talk about other stuff mm. and then I thought back to like a few years ago when I'd probably spend more of my time with like you or Milan and and Ben and and Grant and stuff and like everyone was always talking about ideas like not necessarily about their ideas but like stuff they were reading about and it kind of dawned on me that research quite often happens in like a kind of community way mm. in which like somebody like you just said like somebody might give you a mixtape and you'll be interested in like one little part of it mm. and then you'll find a few years later that you might have come around to the similar things like I think when we went for food recently Milan, you talked about new materialism which was like something that I'd recently come in contact with and was like suddenly making lots of sense mm. so uh, following that I guess what how do you, what like what space do you feel community has in your work at the moment and like is there a there's probably a place attached to that like San Mai Mm. It's probably a big place, and I guess the Slade was probably a place where community happened and it took place in your in your work. So mm. yeah, could maybe if you could talk about that a little bit. Mm. I think um, like more recently, I've been sort of craving a bit of structure and almost like a like how MAs give you structure; they give you you have to go to these lectures and write and stuff and I was sort of craving that a bit and looking up how should I apply to something and then I was talking to someone who just like happened to come to one of the Samay openings I just met her that night and talking to her about it and all these alternative MA structures that are out there and she was like you know you can just create your own one and I was like oh, like what do you mean and she kind of just reminded me that especially in London there's just like so many reading groups and writing groups and like talks and film screenings and stuff happening all the time and I think previously when I was maybe more a student I kind of thought of those as spaces to go and like meet other people and um, almost like brushed over the content of it but more recently I've been trying to go to more things like that where you do kind of sit there with strangers in a room and sometimes there's only five of you there and you have to 
read out your writing and it's like so scary but then you realize that that is like the exact kind of environment that you want where no one has any backstory or like reference to what you've done before and but they're just feeding you with their references and their thoughts and you kind of leave those instances feeling so like if you've stumbled across some sort of amazing secret that you're like I can't believe there weren't a hundred people there and yeah so recently that's kind of what's been exciting me because even though at Saint May we have all of these events like talks and discussions and stuff sometimes I almost like switch off from them because I'm thinking like, oh, I'm here I, I need to close the building I need to like put the chairs away that kind of thing and then you have to kind of stop and remind yourself that actually there's like so much content around you and I think my maybe my um, summertime resolution will be to kind of create that sort of environment within your friends and the people that you see more often because like you said people have so much interesting stuff that they're thinking about and reading about all the time and sometimes we kind of just gloss over that and talk about what we had for lunch and what food we like which is also interesting but um, yeah we can give a bit more space within our closer community groups to actually like share the knowledge um, so yeah that's I think I'm going to try and do that more this summer um, a lot of the time like Milan my partner and I talk about things a lot and because he's an artist as well relevant things come up um, but I think yeah you can talk to your friend who isn't an artist and they're just gonna enlighten you with so many interesting things yeah it's very yeah it's cool it's a really cool thing that I think people should try and make an effort to to do and it, it, I, I think maybe when I was when I was a student it felt like it just happened really naturally mm. because it was I don't know I guess you're in this like really intense period of exploring stuff and like trying to find everything everything new and you sort of still do that afterwards but like you do it yeah slightly more individually and you get a bit more into like what you're doing and stuff mm. so it's it's cool to like to do stuff does your do you still have a studio in like a a shared studio place yeah do they do do they do crits because i know that set sometimes do yeah i think that where we are they don't but there are definitely places around and um it's sometimes it feels like oh is it hard to infiltrate into that kind of circle but I think in some ways it's easier to turn up to things alone um, there's like no baggage and you don't have to feel like the person that you've come with like what do they think like you can just be your own person I think that's really refreshing because you can be your own person but still feel like you're part of this kind of new community rather than feeling a bit like sometimes when you're at uni you have your kind of people that you do stuff with and it feels hard to branch out of that so yeah I encourage everyone to go to events alone <laughs> see what happens yeah it's been nice actually doing these lectures too because it's like you say you know if you're if you're sort of working you start to pay more you know like if I'm stood there with the mixer I'll probably start thinking about like how it sounds or mm -hmm. like the EQ or like do I need to is someone going to fall over that cable and you miss like 70% of what somebody's saying because mm -hmm. for like five minutes you're stood there thinking about how much S you can hear down the microphone <laughs> so I feel very lucky that I've got to listen to lots of people that are like talking about stuff <laughs> um, does anybody have a final question before we Run out of time. A quick one. No? Alright, in which case uh, we can all. Oh. 
Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Do you have any advice? So, like, there's uh, there's not that many third years in the in the room because they're handing in their portfolio today. But do you have any advice to share with people from like your experience of leaving mm. part school and then making stuff? I think it kind of links to the last question or the last thing we were talking about, where you don't need someone else to create that kind of structure for you of things to input into your practice or ways to show work like there's so many people that you've spent the past three years with and that you'll meet just <coughs> happen to meet at some sort of exhibition or event and that's what's all that's what's going to be the important thing for you graduating it's like don't just kind of wait for things to come to you you can kind of go out and look for them and you know you could start a whole talk series with your friends and just talk about stuff you're interested in it doesn't matter if no one else comes because you'll still hear it between you and then eventually yeah more people will come or more people will do the same so I think just yeah stay stay excited and stay intrigued awesome thanks for being uh, very generous <laughs> it's been really cool um yeah round of applause thank you